We're excited to announce that our podcast, The Table with Renee Da Silva, is evolving. We're introducing three new streams of content on this podcast designed for health system CXOs and hosted by the Health Management Academy subject matter experts for health system nurse executives, health equity officers, and strategy executives. With this change, we'll be activating health system leaders towards outcomes and scalable solutions you can implement now. Hello, and welcome to the Health System CXO podcast, featuring three streams of content designed for health system nurse executives, health equity officers, and strategy executives. I'm Jackie Kimmel, Senior Director of Member Insights at the Health Management Academy and Strategy Executives host, sharing the latest market trends and essential insights happening across healthcare so that you can chart a strategic path forward for your health system and move quickly and expertly in the right direction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me on the Healthcare CXO podcast. My name is Jackie Kimmel, and I'm bringing you insights directly for strategy leaders and every other health system executive interested in strategy and how the market is shifting the health system perspective. Today, I would love to start telling you a little bit of a story about two data points that have recently surprised me. And I will say, as background, I am rarely surprised by data points. I read about data, about new numbers, about new trends daily. And usually I have, you know, at least a sense of which way the numbers are going to move. Sometimes I'm a little taken aback, but rarely am I, say, floored by particular numbers. Yet I had a moment of actually being surprised about two weeks ago when I was doing some research on what we call a new crop of cost transparency disruptors. I'm going to explain a lot more what I mean by that categorization. But essentially, um, as we were working on this market intelligence briefing, I was doing some research into the company Surest, which used to be called Bind, for those of you who are familiar. Now, so what is Surest? Essentially, it's a model where, you know, rather than the traditional um, employer-sponsored insurance model, it aims to simplify out-of-pocket costs for consumers and essentially use transparent pricing or negotiated prices between the payer and the provider to nudge employees towards the cheapest options. So patients have no deductibles or co-insurance, but they get upfront prices, notably those are not estimated costs, but actually upfront prices on every service they might consider. And then they can use those upfront prices to essentially decide which, you know, providers they go to, where where they get care, and even, frankly, if they get care. I have several friends who have used um, Surest as an option, so I've been pretty familiar with what they've been doing in the background. But again, I always had the sense that they were kind of operating on the sidelines, even though I knew that United was offering brokers a whole lot of money to push these plans for large employers and that they continually brought it up on their earnings calls as one of their highest growth um, business lines. But then I read this stat. It was essentially that in 2021, so just a few years ago, one in 25 of United Healthcare's employer customers offered Surest as a plan to their employees. Now in 2024, that number has increased dramatically. It's now one in five, an over 15 percentage point growth over the last three years alone in the number of employers that are starting to offer Surest as an option to their employees. Now that in and of itself is pretty notable. I think it's rare for market share to change that quickly. And again, who knows how many employees are actually taking advantage of this. Of course, Surest is is not <laughs> offering those numbers, but we do know that their numbers have been growing pretty substantially and the growth in market share among employers offering it has really been growing pretty substantially over the course of the last few years. So that was an interesting data point by itself. And then I read one other thing. What I read was that When employees use Shuris and select it as their benefit, they notice, and Shuris claims, that employees will select the most, quote, cost-effective treatment option 82% of the time. 
And that shocked me because, you know, you hear a whole lot about how price sensitive patients are, right, in terms of overall treatment cost. But here we have a health plan with no deductible, no coinsurance, but where they're forced to essentially pay the burden of going to a higher cost provider. And what you see is that in 82% of cases, patients will select a more cost effective provider. So that's what's got me really interested in this topic today, and that's how I'd like to spend the rest of our time together, is talking a little more about these crop of new cost transparency providers, including Surest Bind, and also setting the stage a little more for why I think so many health system executives are interested in direct-to-employer offerings over the course of the next few years even though it's been a market that's been tremendously difficult to break into for most health system executives. All right, so let's set the scene. We know that 164 million Americans have employer-sponsored insurance. That's a sizable number, although it is growing much more slowly than any other type of insurance coverage, unfortunately, for most health systems. um, Government lives are growing more quickly. Really, employer-sponsored lives are only supposed to rise about 3% to reach 169 million lives by 2032. But taking a step back, what we see is that employer costs, as I mentioned, have been rising about 5% every year, but they are particularly expected to rise for 2025. The Business Group on Health is forecasting an 8% increase in healthcare costs for employers in 2025. Aon is projecting a 9% increase for 2025, which they say will push the average cost of employer-sponsored coverage past $16,000 per employee. Business Group on Health puts that at $18,639. So a tremendous amount of money that employees are having to pay for their coverage. Notably, employers have been carrying a lot of the brunt of the recent cost increases. So from 2023 to 2024, employer costs jumped 6.4%, whereas employee premiums only went up 3%. So because of what we have in the market, what we're seeing is that employers have been taking on a lot of the brunt of those price increases for their employees. Now, why are we seeing this huge increase? Well, we're always seeing around a 5% increase, but I think the reason that it's at 8 to 9% this year is because of things like inflationary pressure, of course, behavioral health utilization, but also prescription drug spending, especially GLP-1s. And those have been tremendously expensive and really pushing up those employer costs, as many you know, of the health executives will know from your own systems and potentially covering GLP-1s for your own employees. So we have this rising growth in costs, but as I mentioned, it's been often kind of boy who cried wolf in terms of employers actually making notable changes to the structure of benefits for their employees as a result of those rising costs. But what else has happened in the last few years? There are a few new factors that I think are pushing a crop of new cost transparency providers to pop up. First, we have mountains of claims data thanks to price transparency legislation and bigger commercial data sets. We are talking massive troves of information that just weren't available before. Second, AI is making it cheaper and easier to personalize this data. So it's not just about having this claims information, but it can actually be made actionable and relevant to individual patients. And so when you look at those two trends and compare them with that increase in employer costs, what you end up seeing is that there has been a crop of companies that have, you know, kind of popped up to meet a market need focused on how employees search for and access healthcare. And I would say this is a second wave of what we'll call these cost transparency providers. The first wave were care navigation providers, the types of players like Livongo or Grand Rounds, once they merged, who were, you know, trying to do second opinions, trying to push patients in higher quality directions, 
you know, potentially centers of excellence model, those types of things. But the second wave of cost transparency disruptors is really focused on trying to get patients to the lowest cost, highest value provider and using a massively avail massively large available data sets to get patients there. So let's talk about who these types of players are. The obvious heavyweight here is the one we've already talked about, Surest, owned by United Healthcare. Very much a plan aimed at simplifying out-of-pocket costs and using transparent pricing, however possible, to nudge employees towards using cheaper options. As I said, no deductibles, no coinsurance, just trying to give patients upfront pricing on everything. So how it works is Shuris has this very slick smartphone app where essentially users navigate care options with just a few clicks. They assign copay prices based on some proprietary algorithm, and I can share in the show notes a slide of what this looks like and what this takes into account. But it's basically based on what they call, quote, quality, efficiency, and overall effectiveness of care. So they assign a price to each provider based not just on the negotiated rate, but actually on the quality and outcomes of each provider. And what I think is really important for health executives to understand about this is that it's not just one health system, even one medical group, or even one practice that gets a set price. It's actually prices can vary based on based provider to provider within the same practice or within the same health system. And so it's really kind of changing the game when it comes to provider selection and trying to reduce a lot of the pricing um, that health systems have tried to do across the entire medical group. So as I mentioned, Shuris claims that their members are selecting the most cost-effective treatment option about 82% of the time. And Overall, that has actually started to drive down costs in the plan pretty substantially. They see an 11% lower total cost per member, including a 5% reduction in total surgeries, which I find <laughs> pretty fascinating because I don't think that's necessarily pushing someone towards a you know, lower cost provider is going to prevent them having a surgery, but theoretically it might prevent them either because they're cost sensitive or either because they're seeing a provider who doesn't necessarily recommend an unnecessary surgery. They're also seeing a 9% increase in preventative physical exams, including a 34% increase in preventative colonoscopies and a 15% increase in preventative mammograms. And overall, a 10% lower spend on ED care, 12% lower spend on outpatient surgery, and 14% lower spend on physician-administered drugs. So essentially, we're talking, they are seeing a pretty substantial overall price decrease by pushing patients away from some of the highest margin services at the average health system, including things I just mentioned like ED care, outpatient surgeries, and phys specifically physician-administered drugs. What's interesting here is that patients actually tend to like these plans. UHC claims that they have an above average NPS score for the plans, which, you know, uh, health insurance NPS scores are low, so might be a low baseline, but that 90% of members re-enroll year over year into these surest plans. So that is surest, and we can talk a little more about what I think you know, surest means and the rise of surest among employers means for health systems. But first, let's break down some of the other players in this space. First of all, we have Garner Health. And Garner is actually used in partnership with United Commercial Plans quite often. Essentially, they use financial incentives to funnel users towards high performing providers. They use, a, again, a proprietary algorithm looking at patient outcomes data adherence to evidence-based standards of care, and even patient reviews. And what's really, you know, quite unique about Garner is that they have really kind of gotten into the weeds with their data. They will give doctors lower ratings if they perform procedures that recent studies have shown to be less effective. So they're really trying to go into the weeds with the data and figure out who those high quality uh, providers are. 
We spoke with one patient that just had Gardner kind of foisted upon her from her employer and tried to understand how it was impacting her decision making. And it was a really interesting conversation that we had. She said the switch happened fast. It just took about three weeks from announcement to implementation. And she said the app was generally pretty easy to use, but it did have a couple of quirks. But What really started to change her mind about Garner was that she found her long-term doctor was actually not on Garner's list of top high-quality or high-performing doctors. And so she had to basically switch to one on Gardner's list because that was mandatory for her health plan. It also impacted some of her specialty relationships. So she ended up being getting approval to see her ob despite the fact that she wasn't on Gardner's list because um, essentially she just submitted the ob name to Gardner and they said she was high performing enough to be able to go see that ob But her orthopedist was not considered high performing enough to be able to continue seeing her. So again, just one patient's experience, but it gives you a sense of how these new models could start to disrupt these established patient-provider relationships really based on a quality metric and and algorithm that these players are using to assess high-performing providers that health system leaders may not know or fully understand. What I thought was really interesting is looking through Garner's website, I saw an article that talked specifically about brand name health systems, as many of the listeners um, might be at. So what they found using Garner's algorithm is that the top providers at those systems were the top providers in the market. So they their highest quality performers tended to be at the top health system in the market, but that the lowest quality performers uh, providers at those name brands were actually below average in terms of performance in the market. And so what they say is this means that you know X prestigious name brand system shouldn't be thinking of all of their providers as high quality and that their app can differentiate performance between who is actually high quality, you know, in their terms being employed at a health system versus who is low quality. And their push is really to force patients (laughs) to go to see those high quality providers. The second major player in this space is Transparent, and so I'm sure many of you will have heard of Transparent. They've raised a whole lot of money. They've made the news many times. They're taking a slightly different approach because they're starting with a bundled approach to direct contracting. So they're actually partnering with health systems, but the reason that I'm including them in this list of cost transparency focused providers is because what they're essentially doing is they're working with health systems who are willing to negotiate a slightly lower case rate for a number of surgeries. Again, they're starting with surgeries, but only for their most high performing providers. And then they're essentially giving patients kind of VIP treatment in terms of quicker access to care, additional resources and wraparound supports um, as, you know, a, a baseline for being in one of these models. And that's why employers are particularly interested in partnering with Transparent. And so essentially why I think they're included is because they're using that performance data to very much drive which providers are going to be a part of their network and specifically which providers are able to perform those surgeries within their network in order to kind of curate this ecosystem of high quality cost effective providers. They are also looking to expand into primary care, urgent care, home care, etc. Next, you have Sidecar. Sidecar is a little bit different, but they're in the drug space and they set fixed coverage amounts for each treatment or drug. So members can basically choose any provider that they want, no network restrictions, but they, you know, have kind of this set fixed coverage amount for what that treatment or drug will cost. And then we have Collective Health, which is a little bit more like a traditional plan for self-funded employers, but has a kind of interesting twist when it comes to the fact that they have member advocate support agents who essentially really have a high-touch engagement model, and they 
are aimed at redirecting members to less expensive treatment options wherever possible. So kind of an HMO model using additional uh, quality data and cost data. So we've talked through a couple of these different players, starting with Surest, Garner, Transparent, Sidecar, and Collective. And what do I think the rise of all of these players mean for health systems and specifically for health system strategy leaders? I think, first of all, we understand that these are not just a blip on the radar. I think they will actually have some serious implications for health systems as they continue to make greater inroads specifically into the commercial market and specifically with self-funded large employers. So I think these cost transparency disruptors could have four major implications for health systems. The first is very obvious. So first and foremost, we think these companies could start to threaten key commercial volumes for health systems as they start to change how employees make decisions about where to get care. So the the real question in my mind here is how much are patients always going to pick the lower cost option especially with models like Surist, where they actually have to pay more for those higher cost options, even if they're higher quality, or how much are they going to be, you know, going to the higher quality, lower cost in the long run type of provider. And I think that remains to be seen based on what these algorithms are and how these algorithms are changing over time. Notably, many of these are machine learning algorithms. And so I think it will be interesting to see, you know, how they're growing and changing and using data from patient outcomes to start to change these set prices that patients are paying and these services that try to push them to these higher quality, lower cost options. But kind of part and parcel with that, I think the second implication is that these are starting to push um, away the idea of a traditional brand halo effect. So, you know, many health systems rightfully rely on reputation and brand recognition to attract patients. And any employed provider within that brand, within that network, has kind of a a part of that halo effect. But these companies are importantly not looking at the overall brand, but looking at individual doctor performance. So, you know, I think that starts to raise questions around have or have not doctors at systems and, you know, the potential that there's going to be access issues exacerbated if patients are only able to see a certain subset of providers that these services have deemed high-quality, high-performing providers. Third, I think, you know, it's not just about cost here, right? Quality metrics, as I just mentioned, are playing a big role too. And some of these companies are getting pretty granular with their data. So they're looking at things, not just broad outcomes, but adherence to evidence-based care standards and even how doctors perform certain procedures. And as a result of that, I think, you know, it will be interesting to see how much clinical leaders will need to shift metrics or um, incentive dashboards to reflect some of these changes. I think many health systems are, are changing, you know, pay or just have dashboards that are dependent on a certain number of quality metrics. And the real question is going to be, are those quality metrics the same as the ones that these companies are focused on? And if they're not, is there going to start to be, you know, challenges with that divergence? And then finally, you know, I think this could start to lead to a shift in how health systems think about staffing and resource allocation. So instead of focusing on, say, improving outcomes for the lowest performing providers at the department level, we might actually start to see more of a trend towards supporting or hiring star players, individual doctors who are outperforming on key measures of quality and cost effectiveness if that starts to change, you know, overall patterns of where commercial patients are going. I think the major challenge here, right, that that could start to be seen is that you could start to see commercial patients really being forced to or choosing a certain subset of who these players are viewing high, viewing as high performing, high quality, and they have a huge commercial 
uh, case mix. And then those that are not deemed high quality, high performing would, you know, have be much more reliant on Medicare, Medicaid, governmental payer sources, and therefore, you know, start to be a real shift around RVUs and around um, how compensation is arranged across these service lines. So what can health systems do here? I, I think we painted a pretty intense picture. I think there are ways to adapt and thrive in this new landscape. So a couple of things. I think don't ignore this trend. It's gaining momentum quickly. Keep a close eye on these companies and how they are looking to evaluate providers in your market. I think you could consider potentially partnering with some of these disruptors just to get to know their quality and cost measures from the inside. We've heard a little bit of these companies reaching out to health systems and wanting to get health system data to inform their algorithms. Unclear whether that's a good idea. I'm not going to weigh into that. I think that's a question for your legal team, but I think that's an interesting one to consider. Um, you know, I think if you don't own a health plan, think about working with these companies to save on your own benefit costs because it could be a great way to understand how they're operating and how what your patients might be experiencing. And then I think, you know, start to think about how to improve individual provider performance in the ways that these providers are looking at them. So, you know, this is all of the clinical care standardization types of efforts that so many health system leaders are doing. I don't think this trend should push that initiative, but I think it's another reason that, you know, there should be this clinical standardization and making sure that star performers are, are recognized and rewarded for that. And then finally, I think, you know, start to consider doubling down on what you're considering with direct to employer offerings. I think it can be a chance to tell your own story and, and build those predictable commercial volumes. You can offer something that these new players can't, which is a deep understanding of your local market and patient population. And so as employers continue to face these high increases in cost, we know that they're more interested in these direct to employer offerings. We know that those have been very challenging for many health systems to get off the ground. But I think, you know, there's going to continue to be more interest there. And that is a, a certainly something that could start to give health systems more ability to direct where these commercial volumes go and to get to decide how to tell that high performance, high quality patient story in the market. So again, you know, this isn't just about defending market share, but I think it's an opportunity to rethink how we deliver care, how we demonstrate value, and that health systems that can navigate this new landscape successfully can really come out stronger on the other side, especially with these key commercial payers and key commercial disruptors. I would love to hear your thoughts on this trend. Please feel free to drop me a line. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you're starting to see the impact of these cost transparency disruptors in your market and how you are planning to respond. So until next time, thank you. This is Jackie signing off. Thank you for joining me on the Health System CXO podcast, where we activate health system leaders towards outcomes and scalable solutions you can implement now. Remember to subscribe to the Health System CXO podcast on your favorite podcast platform so that you never miss an opportunity for insights. If you liked this episode, consider leaving us a review and sharing our podcast with your friends and colleagues. You can also connect with us on LinkedIn by clicking the link in the episode description. See you next time.